So um, I will talk uh, today about uh, uh, building uh, quantum uh, machines using uh, programmable arrays of neutral atoms. And uh, I would like to frame uh, my talk around basically what many people believe is one of the key challenges in quantum information processing. Uh, uh, that is uh, basically uh, fighting with noise. More specifically, we by now have uh, in several platform systems of hundreds and actually now, you know, thousands of qubits, which is actually a good number. And you can, with them, make a number of steps of computation. But the problem is that um, with kind of any realistic error rate, the number of steps you can make without making errors will always be limited. So in fact, you know, right now, state-of-the-art systems with error rates of maybe a fraction of the percent can make, you know, a few hundred, maybe to a thousand steps. In fact, analog systems currently probably allow for the deepest circuits, you know, compared to a digital approaches. So uh, at the same time, uh, many, you know, most known useful algorithm may require many billions of operations. And what you see is that this kind of, you know, there is a big gap between where we are and where we need to be. So uh, this is a fundamental issue which has been recognized early on uh, when people started thinking seriously about quantum computers. And um, one of the most exciting theoretical developments on the, uh, on the field was an advent of uh, quantum error correction. So uh, quantum error correction uh, uh, works very similar to classical error correction where you use redundancy. You can basically try to kind of, uh, uh, for example, in classical case, uh, uh, make you know several copies of uh, of the state uh, to protect it. Uh, in quantum mechanics, of course, there is no cloning theorem. You cannot duplicate quantum information. Also, uh, to um, uh, kind of uh, uh, detect error, you typically need to measure the state. Measurement collapses uh, the state. Um, uh, but nevertheless, it turns out that you can actually uh, use uh, redundancy to do quantum error correction. And uh, the key idea is to use entanglement to basically non-locally store information um, um, uh, in, in within several physical uh, qubit to encode the so-called logical qubit. So basically, this logical qubit, uh, uh, what you can do, you can measure uh, uh, some kind of checks, the so-called so -called stabilizers, to detect local errors while preserving encoded quantum information. And uh, by being delocalized, this logical degree of freedom becomes very hard to accidentally uh, manipulate. So, and uh, this was kind of early ideas of Peter Shore and Justine um, and others that sort of led to really kind of, you know, a major boost in terms of like believing that one can uh, build large scale quantum computers. So one example, a very famous example um, is a so-called Toric code, which is basically kind of a product of this two kind of classical repetition codes of the type that I have shown, one correcting X errors and another one zero errors. And basically what you do is that you can arrange it very conveniently on the lattice and then uh, you can m uh, make uh, the so-called stabi stabilizers, basically checks, you know, and if this all checks return the value plus one, it means that the state is, uh, is good. But if you have, for example, an error, then it immediately kind of uh, is detectable because some of the checks, you know, uh, change the sign to minus one and then basically by measuring this check, you can detect this error and, and, and uh, correct it. And what's kind of interesting about, you know, uh, this uh, example is that if you now make the, um, this lattice bigger, increase the system size, or as people say, the code distance, uh, then it has a so-called threshold behavior. So provided that the error rate uh, is smaller than a certain uh, value, and it's actually about 1%, then with the uh, increasing uh, system size, the code distance, the uh, errors will dec decrease exponentially. So... Uh, it was this theoretical breakthrough of error correction which really causes the field to take off and eventually, basically most people believe we will need to switch from performing algorithms with physical qubits, with noisy physical qubits, to performing algorithms with logical uh, uh, qubits. But needless to say, realizing these error correction ideas is actually in practice quite hard. Uh, because, for example, you need to have, you know, large redundancy, uh, you need to have this kind of complicated multi-body um, uh, uh, checks, and for this reason, um, uh, 
the, up to now, the current demonstrations have been limited to a very small number, like one or two, three, or maybe very small um, uh, qubits. So we'll try to address this problem by using uh, neutral atom arrays. And um, uh, the way how we build this uh, atom arrays is by basically using optical tweezers, uh, tightly focused uh, laser beams, uh, which um, uh, we use to trap individual atoms. And actually, uh, already kind of early on, uh, we kind of realized that you know there is a by making measurements of uh, just making pictures of these atoms, we can detect, for example, which uh, tweezers are full and which are empty, and that way we can actually extract the entropy. So extracting the entropy is actually a very important uh, notion in quantum error correction. But so in this case, this is purely classical. So basically, once you figure out which traps are full, you can just you know remove the atoms around. You can, for example, reconfigure these arrays. And then you end up with the atoms sitting a few micrometers away from each other, uh, which do not interact. To make them interact, we excite them in the so-called Rydberg states. And this is uh, the project which we started by now nearly 10 years ago, and it's actually still going strong. It's collaboration between my group and uh, two of the Munich alums, uh, Vladen and Markus. So uh, let me just uh, say a few more words about this Rydberg blockade, uh, about this Rydberg uh, state. So, um, we like them because uh, they feature very long lifetime and strong interactions. Um, and, uh, for example, for n equals 100, the Van der Waal interaction is 14 orders of magnitude larger than the Van der Waal interaction between the ground state atoms. And we can make good use of that by using this idea of the so-called Rydberg blockade. So this Rydberg blockade is the following. So what you try to do, you try to resonantly excite atoms from the ground state to the Rydberg state. And if the atoms are far away, they will just undergo independent Rabi oscillations. But if you bring the atoms closer, what happens is that eventually these interactions take uh, off. And then at this point, you will be able to excite one atom or another, but never both. This uh, process in which the simultaneous excitation is blocked is called Rydberg blockade. And this is uh, characteristic distance where it's uh, enacted is a called blockade radius and actually this Rydberg blockade turns out to be a very uh, robust mechanism to actually uh, entangle atoms because it's very insensitive to motion to exact position of the atom in many ways it basically makes interactions between atoms digital so you they either interact uh, kind of almost with infinity uh, kind of strength or if they are far away they don't interact at all and so with this uh, type of approach what we will be doing is, you know, in, in, the, in, in the following, we will be, you know, I will be showing you an experiment in which we first assemble some, you know, um, arrays of atoms. Then we'll uh, subject these arrays to some laser pulses, flip this, the spins, excite them in Rydberg state, and then eventually we'll take another image, in this case, state dependent, so that this will be a projective measurement. And this is now an exciting field with many experiments going um, uh, 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 around the world. Um, and uh, in this conference, we will see some examples. I think strontium talks will, uh, will follow uh, mine. So there will be later this afternoon also um, the talk by Loic about uh, molecules. So some of the systems become very quite fancy. So and uh, uh, actually, Hannes, I think, will give a talk about his effort with two species array. So this picture doesn't show, well, it doesn't do justice to, this is actually an image of over 5,000 atoms in, um, in uh, Manuel uh, Anders' group and, and Caltech. So this is actually an exciting frontier, and it really bridges many uh, interesting topics in quantum science, from many body dynamics to quantum computing to metrology, and actually this approach is very much complementary to optical lattice, and in fact, there are some efforts to kind of, you know, merge these two uh, techniques. So in our lab, um, uh, uh, for the past over a year or so, we're operating this uh, third generation of the atom array. And uh, in uh, this third generation, we basically use special light modulators to create a range of, of static traps to move atoms around. Uh, we actually use this uh, second channel, uh, um, uh, the so-called crossed acoustic deflectors, basically two acoustic deflectors put in 90 degrees. And in fact, we like this kind of device very much. As you will see, we actually now have you know, three sets of them in our experiments. And in this third generation, we basically have a larger systems, high fidelity, and actually much more advanced control. We can trap over 1,000 atoms and make defect-free arrays of over 500 atoms. So uh, I must say, over the last few years, it has been a lot of fun, and we have explored a lot of different directions. Uh, many of them used analog simulations. 
Um, and uh, uh, this is now uh, also uh, like analog a device is actually publicly acceptable, ac accessible <laughs> through our startup company, Quera, where I think some of the students yesterday talked to me. They were already doing experiments on this. Um, uh, but I will talk today uh, um, on a digital uh, uh, approach and in particular on this uh, quantum error correction idea. So uh, here what uh, the kind of one uh, major ingredient has been um, uh, the so-called reconfigurable quantum architecture. So in this architecture, what we do is we store qubits in a long-lived uh, hyperfine uh, states uh, of the atoms, uh, where a lifetime, uh, which we currently have, is a couple of seconds. And uh, uh, only when we want to do the gate, we actually uh, uh, excite the atoms into a Rydberg state using very, very short pulse. Uh, and uh, in addition to uh, the fact that we can store these atoms for a long time, we actually realize that we can also, in a tweezer, we can actually move atoms around. And this gives rise to an architecture in which basically a connectivity is a kind of a living organism. So basically, you know, we can, you know, move the atoms close together, you know, execute the uh, gate operation, then, you know, separate them, you know, change the connectivity, you know, execute another gate operation and proceed in this way. So, and actually it brings up a couple of unique opportunities. First off, this connectivity can be highly non-local, which is actually very good, but in particular it allows for very efficient parallel classical control, which actually is a very special feature, almost maybe a central part of my talk here. And so, we kind of already a couple of years ago, we realized that we can use it to kind of explore this quantum error correction idea. So, um, uh, in that work, we realized that toric code on a torus, so it's a, mm, realizing this, you know, torus in two dimensions is hard, but with this moving atom is actually not very hard. So, uh, in this um, uh, uh, toric code, we have the data atoms, and then we have these ancilla atoms, which uh, basically uh, measure this, uh, you know, do these parity checks, measure the stabilizers. And the way how we can realize the story code is by just using two groups of atoms. One is stationary, and then these ancillas atoms which move, and you see that in one last move, they move all the way across the array. And so this basically allows one to basically do this kind of uh, parity checks non-locally, you know, and in this way, you can actually prepare uh, the uh, Tori code state on a torus. Note that this circuit is programmed by essentially specifying, you know, only two voltages, you know, in the AOD, one going up and down and one left and right, so it's actually very efficient. In fact, we basically, in this case, using these two control parameters in code two qubits, one going, you know, one way around this torus and another one uh, going another way. So uh, last year, uh, we were actually quite busy uh, and we implemented a number of important technical upgrades. So first of all, uh, we improved the fidelity of our two qubit operation to the uh, uh, basically kind of values which is consistent with state of the art, um, kind of above 99.5%. Uh, um, we also realized uh, a, f a fully programmable system where we basically can do parallel single qubit gates by using uh, acoustic optic, um, uh, another set of acoustic optic deflectors to basically shine Raman pulses uh, on atoms and basically uh, rotating the qubits individually. And also we realized, uh, along with many other um, uh, groups uh, in the community, the mid-circuit readout. But in our case, the way how we realize mid-circuit readout is essentially just taking some atoms from like storage or entangling zone and moving them to the readout zone. And here we can just image them you know, without disturbing uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the kind of data qubits or, or kind of uh, qubits which store information. So all of this, you know, put together resulted in this kind of logical uh, quantum processor, uh, which has these different zones. It has a storage zone, it has this entangling zone when we can entangle atoms in parallel by exciting them in Rydberg states, and then we have this readout zone. And actually, if you start kind of looking at it a little bit closer, it kind of starts looking like a real processor. In fact, it's somewhat reminiscent to something which is called von Neumann, or there's actually some version of that called Harvard uh, classical CPU architecture. So, um, the key idea of all of this approach, and if there is anything that you want to kind of take away, is uh, the efficient control now over logical rather than physical qubits. I would like to demonstrate it by on the example of doing C0 operation at two qubit gate uh, between two logical qubits. So normally uh, what happens is that these logical qubits, as I already mentioned, are delocalized. So to actually make the gate, you need to somehow you know, propagate the information you know, between these two patches. And normally this is done by 
for example, in topological quantum computing, braiding particles around each other. But you know, if you do that, you know, you actually have you know high likelihood to make errors. So to correct these errors, you typically need to do multiple checks. You know, in fact, for the code distance d. Um, you need to do typically D rounds of the error correction to make this gate fault tolerant. But there is another way of doing that, and it's so-called transversal gate. So in transversal gate, what we can do, we can just take the one patch, put it on the top of another, and just make qubits, you know, interact, you know, pairwise, and then basically execute the parallel gate and then just move them away. So this transversal uh, CNOT gate has a very several special features. So first off, it's inherently fault tolerant. Errors can mm, spread within the block. So in this case, D rounds of error corrections are, are generally not required uh, for the fault tolerant operation. Moreover, by moving these qubits, we can actually have a long range direct interaction between logical qubits and this actually also can be a significant saving. But most importantly, we can now think about this entire patch of atoms as a kind of a macro atom and control it, you know, in t you know, rather than controlling individual, uh, you know, atoms in, in that, just think about this kind of macro atom as a logical qubit and really act on that. So I will just give a few examples. So one is a logical C node uh, with the surface code. So um, in this case, what we do is pre we prepare one surface code in plus state, another one in zero state, and we do it by starting with the surface codes, uh, kind of of the time that I kind of described, the same same as a kind of toric code just on the surface, and then on one of them measure z stabilizers, another one measure x stabilizers, and then just you know take these two, bring them together, and basically entangle them in one step. And then what we can try to do is we can try to grow the size of the code, you know, from D to 3 to 5 to 7 and see if we actually can improve our gate operation. So this is a result for D equals 7. Uh, we measure, you know, uh, these uh, qubits in XX and ZZ basis. We clearly see that they are entangled. And moreover, you know, what we also see is that if we increase the code distance, the error rate uh, of this created bell pair actually decreases. So that's a key feature of the, uh, of the quantum error correction. Now, it turns out that to achieve this result, you know, we have to actually do things in a clever way. In particular, what we have to do is we have to decode, uh, uh, do decoding jointly. So if you do conventional decoding, the error gets worse. So there are other caveats. So for example, here, you know, um, uh, we just, uh, basically do one round of the operation followed by the measurement. And, you know, for this uh, case, uh, the threshold is relatively high. But nevertheless, what you see is that, you know, this experiment really demonstrates a key feature of error correction, that entanglement and quantum operations of logical qubit improve the system size. And this also points out to some kind of exciting scientific possibilities. For example, this correlated decoding here is very important. Maybe if I have time at the end, I can elaborate on that a little bit. So one uh, um, uh, caveat about these experiments and the reason why actually correlated decoding was important is that our state preparation for large codes was not fault tolerant. So there is another way to uh, pre uh, prepare uh, error uh, correcting codes in a fault tolerant way. And this is something which was actually invented by Andrew Stins, an example of something which is called Stin error correction. So here what we can do, we can just take uh, a pair of codes, in this case is a color codes, and prepare them both non-fault tolerantly, and then use one of them as a kind of as a check for the other. So what you do, you basically make a, a kind of a, a C not gate between the two. Um, and then uh, what you do, you measure this, uh, uh, one of these qubits, and it kind of acts as a flag. If it's in a zero state, you know, it means that the other qubit is most likely in a zero state, but if it's not, then it's, you know, that means there is an error. And so in this case, actually, uh, uh, you can uh, 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 improve the state preparation. In fact, it's the first example of kind of break even in our system where our logical, you know, spam errors in this case are smaller, you know, by actually almost an order of magnitude than the, the, the physical spam error. So experiments like this have been done previously, in particular in a continuum group uh, with ions. Uh, but the advantage we have here is that we don't just prepare work with two qubits, we can work with multiple. So in fact, so this is a result of the four uh, uh, qubits, you know, uh, basically operated in, in parallel. And once we have, you know, these four logical uh, qubits, we can start, of course, making circuit between them. And this, in this example, what we do, we make actually a logical GHG state. And um, 
uh, this logical GID state, again, you can analyze it in different ways. So this is a non-fault tolerant preparation. You see it's entangled by barley. If you have fault tolerant preparation, uh, it's actually uh, quite a bit more entangled. But if you then, in addition to this fault tolerant preparation, do not just error correction, but some kind of error detection, you can basically push this fidelity to one. And uh, it's actually also very interesting that, for example, like, you know, the kind of things that you use for uh, JG state with physical qubits, you typically, to detect a fidelity, use parity oscillations. You cannot do anymore because these logical qubits are digital. But for that, for example, what you can do, you can, you, you know, basically make a tomography of this, of this state. So this is basically an example shows already that there are some really exciting opportunities for exploring error-corrected quantum algorithms with logical qubits. So this is what I would like to talk for for the last maybe five minutes or so. So and um, uh, so basically we are kind of now entering the era of we call it early fault tolerance. So it's not completely fault tolerant, uh, but in this era. Uh, uh, this kind of idea of, of building and testing logical processors will almost certainly rely heavily on this, you know, concept of code design. So basically, if you want to implement certain algorithm, uh, you would like to kind of code design. You can find the most optimal error correcting codes, and then you also want to find, you know, this kind of uh, design them together to take advantage of like hardware efficient operations. And of course, there are other things like compilers, decoders, all of that comes together. So I'll just give one example of that. And this is implementation of non-Clifford operations. So non-Clifford operations are actually uh, quite hard with logical qubits, again, because they're digital. So logical qubits do not like kind of arbitrary phases. They want to be, you know, zero, one, or maybe, you know, um, or, or, or like, you know, pi over two rotation. And so for this reason is actually, um, uh, Non-Clifford operations, for example, for 2D codes are actually quite challenging. And in fact, they require, you know, all sorts of, you know, tricks, uh, which are actually quite expensive in terms of uh, uh, space and time. Uh, but so the question we ask, can we generate uh, a large number of this so-called magic? So magic is a degree of non-Cliffordness uh, efficiently. And actually, it turns out the answer is yes. And, uh, the, and how to do it is to use 3D code. So actually, the smallest kind of interesting 3D code um, uh, is um, this so-called 832 code. So it's basically, it's, a, it's also a color code, but now in 3D with qubits uh, uh, forming this um, uh, cube uh, here. And you can define the stabilizers now with faces and you know, different edges and so on. And uh, what's actually, so it's, it's, it's the distance here is two, so it's actually error detecting code for one type of error and error correcting for another. Uh, but what's actually most uh, interesting is that with these 3D codes, you can do, uh, you can implement CCZ operation transversally. And actually the way to do it is just by rotating phases of individual qubits on, you know, selected uh, kind of uh, si sides of this, of this cube. And so basically, by kind of equipped with that, what we can start doing, we're starting programming quite complex circuits where we first, for example, prepare logical states in a plus state, then imp implement some CCZs and CZs within uh, a given block, and then basically with motion implement C nodes, and then repeat it and basically build more and more complex circuits. So actually in this way, we'll build so-called so scrambling circuits, which grow entanglement very rapidly, and in particular, the kinds of things we will target will be this kind of, you know, uh, uh, these hypercubes. You know, we'll try to make a connectivity which actually uh, starting from physical cubes, you know, making them into higher order cubes. In fact, we'll make up to seven dimensional uh, uh, cubes in this case. So it turns out that this kind of uh, algorithms implement the so-called instantaneous quantum polynomial circuit. So it's actually an example of the scrambling. It's a kind of quantum supremacy type um, uh, circuit, which you know, in a limit of large system sizes is, is hard to uh, simulate. So, okay, so what, how do we, you know, probe it? So this is sampling circuit and um, uh, for a small number of qubits, you know, we can just plot the probability, logical probability of each bit string. And so this gray is a theoretical expectation here. This blue is what we obtain if we don't do any kind of error correction or error detection. So you see that maybe there is like some correspondence between largest probability, but it's very hard to, 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 to see if they are, you know, consistent or not. But if, however, if you now start utilizing this error correction, error detection, so in this case, what you do actually throw some samples away, uh, but, you know, but keep high quality samples, what you see is basically a shadow of this perfect distribution uh, com, uh, comes up and you can actually 
quantified by uh, basically XCB, logical XCB, which is basically a fidelity in this case. So what we see is that, uh, that there is, with this error detection, we are actually getting close to the ideal state. And we can now try to scale the system up. And in fact, we went all the way to up to 48 um, uh, logical uh, uh, qubits with the XCB, which is actually quite decent. And um, in fact, uh, this is actually the most sophisticated logical circuit which we have implemented. And what you see even for this circuit, we basically, this error detection imp improves the fidelity by uh, you know, quite a bit, you know, to like a value of 0.1, which actually is you know, at least an order of magnitude larger than the best, you know, what we could achieve uh, with, uh, with our fidelities. And in fact, you know, it's also larger than a any other system has achieved to date, albeit with this caveat that we have to do some post selection here. So this is actually a movie showing this 48 logical qubit circuit. I think by many measures is maybe the most complex circuit ever executed up today in the quantum machine. And what you see here is you see basically this kind of hierarchical entanglement. So here we run out of space in the entangling zone, bring the atoms from storage zone, entangle them locally, then, you know, more globally, and then, you know, more globally, and then more globally, and then finally what we'll do, we'll entangle them all together. We'll bring the atoms and just, you know, entangle them all together. So, uh, this actually is, you know, quite exciting because you can now start, you know, exploring applications of this kind of circuit. So one of these uh, things which we do, which we did, we measured entanglement entropy in this scrambling circuits by doing two copy measurement. So, and uh, the idea is that, you know, basically to do this uh, entanglement entropy measurement, you just need to ma make two copies and measure in a Bell basis. Bell basis measurement is a transversal operation and this is what we have done together. We started with two copies of 12 logical qubits and then basically at the end make, you know, scramble them and make Bell basis measurement. And indeed what you see here, like you see this kind of classic page curve type behavior where you basically, you know, uh, the entanglement entropy grows up to the system size uh, of about a half. And then if you have errors, it keeps growing, but if you now uh, use this error detection, it just turns around and the state becomes more and more pure. So this really shows that these logical qubits are already starting being useful to probe physics of entangled complex systems. And I think these are really exciting scientific opportunities for, low, uh, for early fault tolerant pro uh, processes. So um, I hope that this you know, uh, results make it clear that this is really kind of quite an exciting time in this field. And I would say with many advances in, uh, you know, in different labs around uh, the world, I think we have really quite clear path to control systems of maybe up to few tens of um, uh, physical qubits uh, using current techniques. I think uh, reducing uh, levels to uh, um, fidelities, uh, physical fidelities to three nines appears to be also very realistic, I would say relatively near term um, uh, uh, prospect. And um, with that, I think there is a path to making, you know, 100 logical qubit devices with like operating, you know, with an error rate and 10 to the minus six, you know, which actually will be, you know, sort of quite, quite beyond what can be achieved with physical qubits. I should say that up to now, all of these experiments are operating as, as all cold atom experiments operate in a kind of pulsed mode. Um, and uh, it's clearly, you know, not the future. The future is that these operates, of, you know, these experiments should operate continuously. You know, some of these algorithms have to run for several days or maybe weeks, you know, but, and there is actually a number of efforts around the world and I, I also believe that this will actually happen, you know, quite soon. But I think there is even like a bright outlook um, beyond that. Uh, so for example, there are now many ideas to do some more power efficient of trapping and, you know, maybe connecting models in a better way. There are also approaches to novel encoding, for example, using uh, the ideas of quantum LDPC codes where you can actually have much higher ratio between the logical qubits and the physical uh, qubits compared to like surface code. And so I think this is really an exciting time. And just to give you a kind of a sense, so this is actually a diagram from our lab drawn by the students making a GAG state. Note that they are now thinking in terms of logical qubits and not the physical qubits, right? So it's really a kind of a, a, a phase transition, I would say. So it's really an exciting frontier. And I would like to emphasize that it, this frontier combines basic science, engineering, and applications, and these are really uh, the unique opportunities. So I think I used up my time. So um, I would like to uh, thank you, uh, uh, you for your attention and all of these people uh, whose blood and sweat resulted in this work.
Okay, Misha, thanks a lot for this exciting talk. Um, I'm sure there are questions. I think we can take two or three. I have this exciting thing, microphone. <laughs> Who wants to start? Uh, maybe actually, let me pass it. You can throw it. Yes, from here. Yeah, yeah, try. Hi. This is, gets more interactive. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for the talk. Actually, I'm wondering if uh, this reconfigurable atomic arrays, like how efficient is this process of uh, moving the atoms around? I see. So the question is kind of like with what fidelity you can reconfigure the array. So basically, uh, uh, it turns out that this process is extremely robust. And uh, I mean, of course, if you do it too fast, you start losing the atoms. So, but kind of, you know, if you are, you know, reasonably slow compared to the kind of, uh, uh, you know, like trapping frequency in particular. So you basically, um, uh, you know, you can, and if, and if you are clever about designing, for example, what we often do also apply uh, dynamical decoupling coupling, uh, pulses to basically prevent decoherence. So then, you know, so long as you move atoms, you basically don't, you know, neither lose atoms nor lose coherence. So we, like in some of these experiments, uh, what you saw is that we need to transfer atoms between stationary traps and moving traps. So this process, there is a little bit of decoherence, you know, um, uh, which you can suppress by going kind of very slow, but you know, if you sort of operate on this, you know, kind of, you know, 100 kilohertz time <coughs> scale, uh, this error at, at the moment is uh, about 0.1%, a little less than okay. 0.1%. I think this also can be improved with all of these clever kind of tricks with the better uh, decoupling and so on. Okay, thank you. More questions? All right. Uh, yeah, amazing as always. But uh, I mean, I was very much surprised on the very first slides. You had a footnote. Quantum error correction is believed to be necessary. Yeah. I was surprised about the believed. Uh, and, then, and then you only do the error detection. Uh, but uh, well, you, well, you are preparing well, okay. so for uh, error correction. Hold on a second. So this, uh, just me, let me clarify things. So. First, um, first of all, I mean, yes, I mean, uh, at the current, with all current methods, we be I mean, we believe that error correction will be needed. You know, perhaps someone invents a new system that, you know, does, you know, something magical, you know, which, okay, I mean, it's, you know, one should not exclude the, I, I try to be positive, you know, so. Uh, the, now, in terms of these results, actually, so, in fact, um, the, Experiments on the on the right, uh, you know, with the surface code and with the GG state, they actually use error correction. They don't, they, they, we don't do post selection there. So the only experiments which required post selection is this ones which involve this kind of large number of 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 the qubits. But actually, it's quite interesting. This, you know, in this case, post selection, actually, in particular for the sampling experiments, actually improve signal to noise, right? Because it allows us to discard, discard the, the bad samples. But I mean, it's very, okay. I mean, I will make two statements. First off, in this near term, you know, we will take whatever, you know, means possible to improve our results. You know, if it requires, you know, more runs, you know, if it makes, you know, people happy, you know, graduate students happy, you know, uh, we will be happy to use them. But, you know, of course, in the long ter term, you really need to use basically error correction because, you know, that, you know, but I mean, some degree of error detection will always be used. So it's kind of a combination, yeah. All right, I think we have to move on, but for sure we'll be have more discussions in the coffee break, Misha. And uh, thanks a lot again for the great talk. And we move on to Andrea Berti.